there um so a little follow up to yesterday's message i actually listened to it three times myself and needed it because the message ended up being for me because <laughs> i had a situation erupt in my home last night that left me just absolutely beside myself and uh going well this has nothing to do with christ and why is this happening to me and how could this you know how is this going to turn out for anything other than evil? And what if this happens? And what am I going to do? And I need to do something. And somebody needs to do something. And who's going to help me? And <laughs> thinking through all the unfairness. Um, and I talked to a couple of friends. And they're like, you need to listen to your message. That was for you. And I knew it was for me. You know, a lot of people said, that's for me. It's for all of us. Uh, I speak what I speak because this is what I need. This is, I speak the comforts that I've received from God and a lot of times the comforts we've received are just in seed form. We've learned the lesson partially but we're still learning it and it's always deeper. Check, a lot of people will say, well, I, yeah, I had that checkmate. That was five years ago when I, no, checkmate is your whole life. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm not belittling anybody's situation. A lot of people really came to the end of themselves but you, you know that, you know, Jacob was weakened in his thigh and walked with a staff for the rest of his life, leaning on a support, which represents God's strength, and that's why he's called Israel. Peace be unto the Israel of God. That's what checkmate is. Um, it's a permanent disabling. Uh... And there are certain arrangements that God brings us into that are, you know, I remember we were in one church where they loved classic hymns and classical hymns, hundreds of years old. But we, uh, some of the younger ones of us, counted how many hymns had the phrase, sea billows roar. The, the old hymn writers loved sea bellows roar and it showed up in many hymns and sea bellows roar was really a phrase i think from the psalms but whenever you're talking about the sea bellows roar you're talking about the waves of the sea crashing so far above my head uh and the situation so overwhelming that the only the lord can hold the boat up you know and sea bellows roar and i look to the lord you know uh yeah sometimes Death, the life we're in, the crashing waves of the sea, you know. Uh, anyway, it's tough, man. Um, but I wanted to do a quick follow up to say this is what, again, we're talking about God's discipline. What is God's discipline? God's discipline is not a punishment for your sins, God's discipline is a training for you to come to a place where you recognize that the only way to go on is Christ and everybody has their breaking point and not everybody ever not everybody reaches it at the same time some people just don't ever reach it because they resist the discipline they don't learn the lesson they always harden themselves they always err in their heart they never learn his ways that's one of the things about Hebrews that he refers to is like these people always err in their heart they've never known my ways and they will not enter rest because they've always got another piece or think they've got another piece they should move or can move it's never that you know jesus the name means jehovah saves and when the angel promised him to joseph i was reading matthew this morning because i think i'm going to read it with my kid but uh Jesus, he's going to save his people from their sins. Do you believe that? You know, I've got situations where I'm hedged in because of sins. Either my sins in the past or people's sins in the present. And then people who are going to react uh, that are ruled by sin. <laughs> I need Jesus to save me from sin. Not just... To give me peace with God, 
but also to set the limits of what sin can do in my life and the life of the people around me. That's what redemption is for. How much is sin lording it over my life and calling the shots here? Or is Jesus Christ the Lord of my life? Well, he is the head of my, he is the Lord of my life and I'm under grace. I am not under the law. And that includes being under its curse and the wage of, the wage of sin is death. And, uh, you know, you've got it, you're going to reap what you sowed. You know, I used to be under a teaching in the charismatic church that was, you reap what you sow and you have to sow good seed in order to reap blessings. And if you sowed bad seed, you're going to reap that harvest until it exhausts itself and meanwhile you need to while you're reaping the bad harvest from the bad seed you sowed you've got to be sowing the good seed so that you can reap the good harvest and that's where the idea of outrunning your sin or out serving your sin comes from and that doesn't work because corruption begets be corruption so if i'm sowing to the flesh and i'm reaping corruption now and corruption is my wage, then all I have to work with is corruption. How can I sow good seed, you know, to reap blessing while I'm dealing with only corruption? You know, the soil is corrupt, the seed is corrupt. That's not what that's saying. What, what he's saying is if you sow to the flesh and it's strength, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to the spirit, you reap life. Not only in this age, but in the age to come. And it's right now. It's not talking about karma where you've got to build up a, a certain amount to get the engine rolling, get the engine roaring to, uh, and, and the machinery going to build up enough credit or juice, you know, spirit juice to get the flow going so something will come out. <laughs> That's what I used to think. So when you when I would hit times in my life where everything just sucked, it's like there's no way I'm gonna be able to sow good things. So I'll never have a blessing if I if it depends on me sowing good seed, you know. <laughs> um, no, that's not what that's talking about. To sow to the spirit means to be an Israel of God, where I I, I can't do anything. And it's also, this is to be pure in heart because those who are pure in heart see God. I'm not looking at myself and my record and my ability and what I can do anymore because it's all dung. I count it all as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And I'm turning from it all and my, reckoning myself dead. Dead to sin, dead to the world, dead to the law, dead to the performance, dead to the wage. Alive to God in Christ. And I'm really looking to him, saying... You know, Lord Jesus, I can do nothing apart from you. You have to intervene here. And then he is Jesus who saves his people from his their sins. I don't know what that's going to look like, but that's what I need. And that's what he says he is. Um, and the first thing he saves me from is my own disposition of erring, erring in my way. And see, some people never get there. Uh, and they always err in their ways. They always revert to works and the flesh. And no matter what God brings them through, they get stronger and harder. I can, okay, this time I can real, I can see the lesson I should have learned is. I should have done this and this and this. Now I can see I need to do this, this, this. You No, you have not learned that the problem is me and I need to be put out of the way and I can do nothing. You won't learn it. You can't learn. That's why the opposition um, to God is strength, not weakness. You know, the Calvinists say total depravity means I'm so weak that I can't do anything. I can't even believe the gospel not because of weakness. I'm dead. But it's man's strength that is his problem, you know. Um, and 
I mentioned yesterday, you know, you can stand up in your own strength and try to fix everything and get everything to line up to God's will, like Pharaoh. He didn't try to line up to God's will, but I used Pharaoh as the example of a hard heart because Romans 9 uses him as the example of a prototype of Israel standing in the hardness of their heart, establishing their own righteousness, and then being blind to Jesus Christ and grace. And that was the hardness that led them to be so blind that they were cut off. They could, you know, that, that produces a hardness and a wrath against God that causes you to be blind from grace, blind to grace. And Christians can live there in the futility of their mind, um, where they cannot submit to the discipline of God. They never recognize it in their life. They don't know its purpose. Now, one of the reasons for that is bad teaching about discipline. You know, the, the, the pastors teach you that discipline is God coming in and punishing you for your sins so that you'll learn never to do that thing again. Take you out to the woodshed, beat the crap out of you. because And then that way you'll know, well, if I do that again, then I get beaten again. I don't want to do that. As if you made some decision to do what you did. Um, which means that you don't understand that there's something more fundamental about you that you should be afraid of, that you don't have control over, the sin nature, and that you need a savior to save you from your sins. The discipline of God is not to punish you for your sins so that you'll make a decision not to sin again. The discipline of God is to, sh is to teach you that you need a savior and to get you to run to him. And the bad teaching on the discipline of God actually teaches people to run from him. Because they say, well, you better not get caught doing that. You better not get caught by God. He's going to come after you. And if he does and he disciplines you, it'll be horrible. And they teach discipline as if it's something that could be avoided and should be. And... The Bible says no one can avoid discipline if they're a son of God. Even Jesus was taught, he learned obedience through the things he suffered. He learned how to surrender himself to God utterly. That was something he never had to do before. And we'll talk about that in Hebrews, but he would never had to cry out to him who's able to raise him from the dead and be heard. Uh, with loud crying and tears to him who heard him and say, into, my, into thy hands I commit my spirit and yield himself t entirely to the will of God in absolute submission uh, like that. At contrary to his flesh's survival instinct. Did, he'd never had that before the incarnation. In weakness, totally surrendered to the will of God, not having the absolute control over what happens next. You know, that's a new, that, that was what he learned. That's the obedience he learned through suffering. That, and that is discipline. What is discipline? Discipline is the training to be yielded to God so that I'm not the one calling the shots. Um, and it reminds me of Peter, you know, Jesus said to him, when you were young, you went where you willed, but, uh, you girded yourself and went wherever you will. But when you're old, someone else will gird you and take you where you don't want to go. And it does say, this is speaking of the manner of death that he would die. He would follow the Lord. But at the same time, it's also talking about the way we live. You know, we don't choose our course. The, and, and guess what? This is a message about the discipline of God to yield to him. But it's also a message about the sovereignty of God. This is an actual sovereign grace message. We've been talking about the Calvinists for quite a while. If they were to preach a sovereign grace message like this, we wouldn't have a problem. Uh, to use what the scripture says about how God orders our steps and he's hedged us in and he set us before and behind and he's placed his hand upon us and he foreknows us he's working all things together for our good 
and surely goodness and mercy shall follow thee the days of all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because of God's absolute sovereignty uh and and to use the now what the scripture says about his sovereignty to assure us of his goodness towards us instead of using it contrary to the scriptures to contradict what the scriptures reveal about his desire that all men would be saved man's accountability and ability to believe the gospel uh the proclamation of the gospel to all creation the availability of the atonement to every man who believes all that uh and double predestination that god created most people for wrath and it's good his good pleasure that they go to hell you know that is not the sovereign grace of god so it's just ironic that this message i so badly needed uh and many people say they really needed to hear that um it was a true so- so-called sovereign grace message and this is one of the reasons i believe that the devil uses calvinism to stigmatize predestination and and god's knowledge and his um authority over the believer's life so that you will be so repulsed from it and so in favor of the so-called sanctity of man's choice uh that it'll be foreign to you this idea that god is checkmating you as a way of dealing with you <laughs> and bringing you to a place where everything is working in your life and it seems adverse but it's for your good uh even though you're interpreting it wrong and as long as we interpret it wrong we are at odds we're not at peace and we're fighting against god and erring in our ways and complaining and saying you know we're not yielded um so what's the way is it is it a once and for all i yielded no it's every day and you know this is how he gets us renewed and this is how we grow in the knowledge of jesus christ is and ev- he he lets us have certain situations that are just in our face young people don't understand this they think that they will learn whatever they need to learn and get the skills and they won't have the problems that their stupid parents face <laughs> you know my older son he's uh 21 and he he insists he knows where he's going to live and you know they're going to they're going to live in this they're going to do they're going to be in a rural town first and then they're going to move to the suburbs and he's got an opportunity if he moves straight to the suburbs to be a teacher in a, in one of the best districts uh in the country and it'd be like winning the lottery because the retirement program is absolutely insane his wife's in, or, or his mom's in it and uh i mean it's insane <laughs> i've never seen anything like it he retired 55 uh and then make literally what you were making uh and more every week for the rest of your life that their pension program is so good uh it's better than anything i've ever seen and he could have that but he wants to be with this girl and she's got another year in college and he's like well i'm going to just I'm going to get into a district here in this rural area which is a bad idea because it's uh you know um small town they don't have the resources so he's going to get called on for every kind of duty and he's never going to see the girlfriend he's going to be a music teacher and he's going to be doing band camps and he's going to be filling in for the gym guy and this all of this I mean that's the way it works he never going to see the girlfriend he should come home live here save up money and go work in this district and have his foot in the door where he's got all kinds of opportunities he grew up in the district he's got two parents who teach in the district he's got recommendations he's got all kinds of scholarships and he was you know straight a student and all that stuff so he could just walk right in now i'm going to i'm going to go teach in a rural school out here until my girlfriend graduates and then when we're ready we'll come to the su- suburbs 
Now that's all under the assumption that life moves at his point pace and he makes his choices. What he doesn't understand is that when she moves out, or she gets out of college, they're going to be, you know, already in a routine. He's going to be tired from working his job where they've overtaxed him. And he's not going to, he's going to have the security of that job. And he's not going to want to rock the boat to come here and look for another job that he may not get. And the rent here is twice as much. And he'll already have accustomed himself to a standard of living and a low, you know, cost of living there um, that it wouldn't even make sense in his mind. He, You know, it makes sense for him now to leave high school or leave college, come home, live with us and go get the job with the good income and and build up the money so that he can then afford and his mindset is set for the cost of living out here. And he gets an apartment at this rate. And then his girlfriend comes out. They get married or whatever. And and he's already in the district. But if he goes, if he graduates there and goes into small town living for a year. And works in the rural district at this super low pay with low benefits. Uh, and has barely enough money to pay his rent. We did the budget with him. You know, you're barely going to be able to pay your rent. You're not going to have any money left over. And you live like that for a year. Well, that's going to change your whole perspective. So that when it's time for her to leave, you're not going to think, oh yeah, let's move to the uh, suburbs, (laughs) pay double for rent, um, and I'll try to get a school and a a job in this district. When you're going to be already so beaten down and tired... And worn out from what you're already doing. He can't see that, but I can see that. But young people think, oh, I'm smart. I'm not going to do what my parents told me to do. They're stupid. They don't know. They don't know the toll that life takes. Life takes a toll. Um, okay, that was a huge tangent. <laughs> that's not my kid situation. That That's my older kid, and he's fine. But, the, you know, he looks like he could make a dumb decision. It's, like, hard to watch. But... We can't control them, you know. But it's because he thinks he's so strong. He doesn't need our advice. He's got it all together. Right? And God's, God wants to do everything for us. And uh, when we err in our ways, it's that we do not rely on him. And we don't live dependent upon him. And his discipline uh, is to teach us, number one, that we can't do anything. And he hedges us in, and he also teaches us in hedging us in his sovereignty and our absolute dependence on him. And it's not a doctrinal teaching. It's experiential. But when it happens, that's when Paul says in in Hebrews, don't harden yourself. Don't harden your heart. Don't resist the discipline of God. Everybody receives it, and it's for your good. And while you're going through it, it does not seem pleasant. It seems scary. But you've not come to the Mount Sinai. This is not the law. This is not your sins. This is not the blood of Abel, which is crying out for vengeance. This is not some consequence for something bad you did. And the point is not for you to die. This is for your good. This is Mount Zion, city of the living God. The saints, the uh, spirits of the just men made perfect. The blood that speaks better things than that of Abel speaks for your justification. It's a festal gathering, and it's out of love. When he disciplines of us, it is never a punishment for sins. It's not out of wrath. It's in his wisdom for our good out of love to make us partakers of his holiness, which is, again, in our view, a partaker of holiness is a bad, burdensome thing. And I did that message, when I say holiness, do you think love? When we went through Jude. Because we think holiness means sin less, keep law. Don't get God mad. You know, we, we associate holiness with Mount Sinai. But there's a holiness in love 
that is the spirit of sonship and Christ wrought in you and, and the precious treasures of the new city Jerusalem uh, distilled as living water coming out as pure as crystal to quench your thirst and saturate you with Christ and give you a fragrance of a holy person so that you're different from the world. You're separate, you don't live like the world, and not only that, but you're actually a fragrance of Christ wherever you go. Uh, that's holiness. It's Christ. Christ is our sanctification, and it's in love. Holiness is, We perfect holiness in love, uh, which is different than our concept. And he, when he says, you know, that he disciplines us for our good, that we may be partakers of holiness, Hebrews talks about partaking twice, or three times, partakers of the heavenly calling, partakers of Christ, and partakers of holiness. And all of them are Christ. And that's what the training is for, that we would actually interact with him directly and partake of him, not just doctrinally, but that we'd actually lay hold of him and because he wants to manifest himself to us. That's what it's for. It's so that he can actually manifest himself to his people. And that's deeper than just doctrinal knowledge. It's where he is actually tangibly revealed to you as your joy. And as your peace. Uh, in the midst of the so-called sea billows. <laughs> so that you live transcendent. And that is an everyday partaking of him in rest. And maybe it's every day you have to come to him and partake. Every day I'm thirsty, and he makes me aware of my thirst uh, by showing me my need and reminding me how desperate I am. And yet, opening me up at a deeper level than I've ever been able to open before to drink of him because my need is deeper than it's ever been before. And yet, because that need and thirst is so deep, the satisfaction is that much deeper. And the riches he's able to pour in is that much deeper. The work he's able to accomplish is deeper, and the manifestation of Christ is deeper, and the truth is clearer, and the light is brighter. And this is a light that shines brighter to the perfect day. And he's coming. And I've always said there's a season of refreshing coming for the children of God. Uh, well, he did say that he would lead us through affliction, <laughs> but we go out with crowns of joy. Uh, crowns of everlasting joy and singing, you know, both are probably true. I don't know. This world is getting tough to endure, and um, we really need to have our eyes on Christ, and He knows how to get our attention. The only thing I can say is, you know, if you're going through this, recognize it and say, and if you're resisting God and you're angry and saying, this isn't fair. And what I've gone through isn't fair. And I fear tomorrow because I don't think God is there for me. You're erring in your way, in your mind. You're not reconciled to the truth. And you need to say, Lord, soften me. Because this is not just a doctrinal knowledge issue. There's a disposition in your heart that's standing against the truth when we say things like that. And we all have the tendency to say it. After last night... It was one of the worst nights I've had in 10 years um, after some things came up. Uh, I was drowning in some self-pity and uh, those kind of thoughts, you know. And all I can do when you recognize it in yourself, I, it's like, I don't know how to be reconciled to God in this. I don't know how to lean on you in this. I don't know how to trust you in this. Uh, that's your weakness. And, and that's the temptation. And you have a high priest for weakness who's touched with the feelings of your weakness and intercedes for you in weakness. And he groans with groanings that cannot be uttered and draws you to himself. He is drawing. Don't resist the grace of God. Come to him and say, I'm weak. Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. Lord, just gather me to your bosom and keep me there. 
I'm not strong to believe you. I'm not strong enough to say, oh, God's working everything together for my good and I've got it all together. That's not what he's asking for. He's asking for weakness. Give it to him. That's the only currency I've got. Weakness, uh, admission, and uh, the blood of Jesus Christ, you know, which is the real thing. Faith in the blood. That is my qualification. Even though I'm weak, even though I'm mostly in unbelief, I do believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. Based on the blood of Jesus Christ, I know I have peace with God. That has not shaken. I know that the blood of Jesus Christ paid for my sins. I know that it redeemed me from the curse. I know that I've been transferred out of the authority of darkness. I know my whole household is redeemed and under the blood. And I expect salvation. I have Jesus Christ. He is the Savior who saves us from our sins. Whatever that looks like, I expect to see the salvation of God in my life. I expect, you know, Paul said, this shall turn out, his prison situation, which was leading to his martyrdom, he said, this shall turn out to me for salvation through your petition of the bountiful supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That is always, even now with all boldness, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether through life or through death, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's salvation. You know, I want I know, Lord, this will turn out to salvation. What is salvation? That Christ would be magnified in my body, that I would live Christ. That's what I want. We're all gonna die anyway. Uh, most of us who are over forty know people close to us who are facing health stuff and we know the end of it is coming eventually okay and we know that they're miserable and they don't know how to live christ and they're gonna live themselves and die miserable and we're gonna go not much longer after them probably so we want to live christ and die gain. <laughs> We want Christ to be magnified in our body. This is something that older people had to face. We're going to bite it. So let's live Christ. And that is not to say, let's be super holy super Christians. No. I want to know the salvation of God. And I want Christ to actually be manifest to me. I want the real thing. I don't want religion. I don't want a substitute. I don't want the flesh. I want Christ to be manifest in my life. He said, if you love me uh, and you love my word, you'll keep my word and my father will love you and will manifest and I will make my abode with you. Well, that's what we're looking for. Let's, uh, let's have a life where Christ is actually making his home in our heart. You know, that's available to us failures who got spit out of religion, spit out of Babylon, and are sitting at home by ourselves going, well, now what? <laughs> you know, he's not, cut, he has not closed the door on everything and shut the door to the pasture. No, he closed the door on everything and opened the door to the pasture. So that's where we're going. The pasture is the feast. The pasture is Christ himself with all of his riches, and he's really going to be enjoyed. What we've gotten so far is a glimpse of the treasure and a probably a display menu. We've been looking at the menu and everybody's like, oh, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. We're looking at the menu and going, this is the greatest thing I've ever heard. But the Lord's like, yeah, but you haven't sat down to eat yet. <laughs> I have a feeling that he wants us to sit down and eat. And that's what his discipline's for. All right, I got to get going.